Uh, we wondered, we've moved the, um, the two uh, candelabra. Well, we've moved one of them onto the table at the end, you guys, and we've moved... The it's not in the middle, Christine, is it? Not quite. I don't think it is quite. I mean, it's... The ceiling looks fantastic, doesn't it? You really would think that the gilt had been done, wouldn't you? It's, um, it's washed out so... And it's only been washed, hasn't it? Yes. But the paint's new, but the gold is washed. Morning, Anne. Morning, Measuring, as usual. Yes. yes. I have to get them straight. What do you think it looks like with the red? It's beautiful. Do you think? Oh, it's a great improvement. Yes, you I really like do? It. I do, I really do, yes. Have you got some big silver plates, Ian? Uh, yes, yes, we've got those, <laughs> um, <laughs> what I call threepenny bit shaped dishes. You know, the big ones that go on the middle of the The ones with the kind of scallop plates. That's right, you guys, yes. Well, why don't we try those? Well, very good, yes, sure. yes. And uh, he'll be, Ian will be back when? Tomorrow? Uh, what is today, Wednesday? You're probably back tonight. No, so you'll probably yes, be, be around tomorrow. Very good, Grace. Thank you. So, let's try that. Very good. Otherwise, it looks beautiful. One step, do we? One step. Two steps. One step. Well, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and um, welcome. Uh, we start on a new season, um, and uh, on behalf of the Duchess and myself, I would like to say how immensely grateful we both are for, to all of you for all you do. Uh, I cannot tell you how proud we are of this house. It's the way you keep this house. It absolutely shines, it's burnished. The boards on the drawing room passage are so polished that I could shave in them. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, anyway, uh, the months ahead will be a lot of, lot of hard work for you. Thank you for all you've done in the past, where you keep this place so beautifully, and thank you for all your cheerful, smiling faces when I go about the house. That is our acutely conscious of how lucky we are to live here. But my word, it wouldn't be half as much fun living here if, it, if we weren't surrounded by such marvellous people at all. From the bottom of both our hearts, thank you very, very much indeed. In her boudoir, the Duchess has a hidden window through which she can keep track of the flow of visitors. I don't really know who made that little window, but it is genius because it's one pane from a false window which you see from the outside. And I guess, I guess it was about a Duke who did it because he planted that avenue of tulip trees there and you see straight down it. And what is so nice, if you sit at that table, you can see who's coming. Chatsworth is in the big league in the stately home business. The restaurant has a turnover of one and a half million pounds a year. There are four shops, including a farm shop and the orangery at the end of the public route. Together, they gross over three million. The driving force behind the selling of Chatsworth is obvious. It's difficult to draw the line, really, where you're trying to support the place and making it possible for everything to keep going in the, in the old-fashioned way and doing your best for the place, at the same time not to overdo the commercial. But I don't think it is too much done here, myself. But I think if it's done well, then it's, it's an asset and not a liability. The climax of the Chatsworth season is the country fair in September. It's been estimated that half the population of this country live within an hour's drive of the Peak District National Park. This is day tripper land, and the country show attracts 100,000 visitors in two days. I think most of our visitors probably come from the Sheffield area, Nottingham. We've got a very, very big towns around here, a lot of huge towns. And they like coming to the country anyway and walking in the park, which they can all do for anybody can do for nothing. No charge made for that. And so it's a kind of lung, really, in this district for people. And I, it, as it's always been open to the public, it is a, a kind of habit. People's grandparents have been, and their parents brought them as children and so on.
This event raised £30,000 for charity, but it is also excellent promotion for Chatsworth. In the tourism business, there are few aristocrats who can compete with the Duke and Duchess of Devonshire. But not all those with great houses made them pay in the 1980s. This is Wynyard, the home of the Marquis of Londonry, until May 1987. One of England's finest 19th century houses, and now it's owned by the son of a North Seton Pitman. John Hall, the man who built the Metro Centre. The paperwork was completed today, and he's enormously proud of his new home. It's a palace, in effect. What you're looking at is a palace. And here we are. Did you buy all the paintings that go with Yes, we did. We, uh, because what you're coming to now, it's history. You're actually in the history of the North East. Wynyard, of course, ended up with me and, and ended with me. Um, after years of valiant struggle, we did try hard to keep Wynyard going, but um, it, I always knew in, in my heart of hearts that it was doomed. It was always the eternal conflict between living in a house and opening into the public. Which I, I, I know there are examples where this has worked, like Chatsworth and, and, and Long Leader, two examples immediately come to mind. But it... It, it, I'd never really worked at Wynyard. Have you bought yourself some history here after coming from a coal mining village? Yes, I suppose so. I, in many, many ways, through in the other room, there's a painting of the Third Earl. And he was the businessman, the entrepreneur. He built the same collieries and all the railways in that part of uh, the area. And, and I suppose I'm very much like him as an entrepreneur, developer, a businessman. This was the classic case of new money usurping the old. An aristocratic family who'd made their money from owning coal mines in County Durham had been bought out by Sir John Hall the epitome of the Thatcherite self-made man, and himself the son of a miner. Well, bully for him. I mean, fantastic to have... Uh, he did start. His origins were humble, and he's got where he has through hard work and skill. Bully for him. I'm going to fill in the pool, and this is going to be a conservatory, and again, for functions, because just through those doors is a private chapel. So people will hire this out for the wedding yes, receptions, yes, what have you. It's, it's got so many uses. I remember the morning I left, it was just an absolutely awful memory, ghastly memory, and I had to drive down here on that morning. That was awful. I just walked around looking at these empty rooms and the, the remaining staff were in tears. One thing I'm glad to say is I never broke down. It was very easy to do. I did have to visit people, say goodbye to them, and, uh, and one or two of them broke down. I don't know how I didn't, because I'm very sentimental and I can break down. They burst into tears at the drop of a hat, but... I'm very uh, glad that I didn't break down there. It was, yes, awful, absolutely ghastly. But, you know, um, as, uh, Charlotte, as Scarlett O'Hara said, you know, tomorrow has to be another day, I'm afraid. So I, I plunged on regardless. I've recreated Wynyard here, that's the thing, as nearly as I can. In his new home, a modest farmhouse in Dorset, Lord Londonry has created something of a shrine to the history of the Londonry family. Memorials of family dogs were moved from Wynyard to the new garden in Dorset. And inside his new house, Lord Londonry surrounds himself with family memorabilia. This is a scale model of Wynyard, which I had made before I left it. And um, it, it's extraordinarily accurate. I mean, it, this is how it would have been finished off if I'd lived there and everything had gone differently. This is what the house would have looked like. So it's a scale model of Wynyard as it might have been if I'd lived there. Nearly everything that was in it has come down here. Uh, practically everything. The odds and ends that you see around you, for instance, all these statues used to be in the hall at Wynyard. And um, whether they ever thought they would end up um, in a grate, I don't know, but they look rather good, I think, actually. It's a see-through grate. It, it's slightly different from where they were before, but uh, I think they look all right, frankly. Here, this is... Uh, this is a recreation of Wynyard as it was, the drawing room at Wynyard, and this is almost identical. This reminds me of Wynyard as it used to be. It's slightly different to Wynyard, the two pianos are here. It's a slightly bigger room than the drawing room at Wynyard, but that's enabled me to have virtually all the family portraits in one room. This is Frances Anne, the third Marchioness of Lundry, and this is her aunt, Mrs. Angela Taylor. She's um, supposed to be Miranda there. Uh, she wasn't an actress, but she dolled herself up as Miranda for the purposes of the portrait. Um, she was a bit of an old battle axe from the sound of it. Uh, she was um, her aunt and she didn't want her to get married to the third Marquis because he thought he, she thought he was a treasure, a treasure hunter. 
which he was in a way, but so what? I mean, he, he, he married a, an heiress and he put her money to really good use. So, you know, if you marry money and put it to good use, well, what's wrong with that? You're fascinated with your own family history. Does it also, and you're surrounded by these objects here, do you sometimes want to not be surrounded by them and not be well, borne down by the weight of your ancestors? I always have been surrounded. It's too late to do anything about it now. I've been brought up surrounded by an an ancestors. And um, I'm surrounded by memorabilia, ancestral memorabilia, and uh, nothing I can do about it now. So it's, it's part of my... It's part of me. But as I say, I've got all the eggs in one basket here, which is nice. This land in Staffordshire has been owned by the Wolseley family since before the Norman Conquest. The garden park here was created by Sir Charles Wolseley in the late 1980s. But now, for the first time in a thousand years, the family lands are in jeopardy. Sir Charles ran up an overdraft of two and a half million pounds to develop the ten-acre garden. The original idea was Lady Wolseley's. My idea was not for it to be as large as it turned out to be. I just said, you know, we were going around Montesfort Abbey, uh, where they have a National Rose Collection, which is in an old wall garden. And it was a rainy day in July, and the place was packed. And I said to Charles afterwards, I said, well, we've got a bigger, better wall garden than that. We could, we could, you know, do a rose garden and... It sort of all started there, I mean, if I had kept my mouth shut. But the more we thought about it, the more fees 